It's really scary when your dog suddenly goes after your friends you have over for drinks and a good time, right? And it's even worse if you can't even relax on nature walks because your dog goes crazy whenever you see another dog, wildlife or a person. Today we're going to talk about reactivity in an insecure dog who would not show it and you're going to meet Tink. So stay tuned and have fun. All right, so very often insecurity is obvious, right? It's a dog with a tuck tail who would not make eye contact, who may hide either behind the caregiver or behind furniture or in a corner or wherever he or she can. But there are dogs who have practiced being aggressive or aggressive behavior so much that they feel really confident it's gonna work. And that's when they don't look scared or insecure anymore. They look very sure about what they're doing. And this is when they get the label aggressive. But it's nothing else than a dog hiding behind his mom and barking out. So Tink was one of those dogs. He had become so sure of himself and of his action that he looked very certain. He looked very, well, a little bit scary actually because he was a big dog he was a Malinois mix but he was black so big black dog always the center of attention when anything bad happens right people tend to be a little bit scared or a little bit more scared of big black dogs than tiny white ones so this was not making things any easier. Now, he lived with a very awesome human. So his mom was great. She did everything she could for him. And she had him since he was a puppy. And since she wanted to do everything right with him, she took him to a dog school and they did everything dog schools in my area do. So sit down heel and everything very loudly. So the dogs had to be yelled at. The humans were not allowed to talk quietly with them. They had to yell every command because the dog should only know yelling since when they are further away, they have to be yelled at, which is ridiculous, right? But all right, they taught it that way. So the people were always yelling at their dogs. And since Tink was a Mali mix, he was not necessarily the most patient dog. And he was very sensitive. And at the same time, very quick in his responses and very quick to get overwhelmed by situations. Now, this is not only the breed, but sometimes they tend to be like this a little bit more. So at that training facility, he did show signs of discomfort because the other dogs were too close. Everything was going too fast, everything was too loud, and he also very quickly developed some pain issues in his neck because they really wanted the dogs to walk in a heel with looking up for quite a long time and always on the same side, and this is not a good idea. It makes the neck very sore and very stiff very quickly. So this was also an issue for him. He showed that with avoiding lifting his head and moving it as little as possible. 
So this is always a nice indication of a vet check being in order. Now, since he couldn't perform as well as the trainer wanted him to, his mom really didn't care that much about obedience or anything like that. She just wanted to do what's best for the dog. But the trainer made her believe that absolute obedience is good for a dog and that dogs have to obey at all times and be submissive at all times. Otherwise, they would become dangerous. So they scared her into doing what they wanted her to do until they told her that she had to put the choke chain on him and start protection work with him so that he could channel his aggression in a good way. And that was when she decided that this was not the way to go. And she started looking for different options. Now, Tink was at a point where he already barked and snapped at other dogs. And he tried everything to be a good dog. He was so in his role that he really wanted to make things right. And later on, when we had made huge success, we noticed one behavior that stuck with him. Whenever he got a little bit insecure, he would immediately rush up to the left side of his human into a heel position. That was so stuck with him that it was almost like an abnormally repetitive behavior. So stereotypical. Almost. You could hardly interrupt him doing it. And it was not dangerous for him. So it was nothing we had to get out of him immediately. But it was very clear that this had been drilled into him so extremely that it was no longer his choice if he wanted to do that. He felt like he had to do that. Now, this breed can sometimes be a little bit obsessive. And this was what we were seeing with him and this behavior. Now, he was not having fun doing that. He just felt like he needed to do that, which was a bit sad, I think. But it was a clear indicator of him being uncomfortable. So we needed to really take all the situations he felt uncomfortable with, and it was pretty quick he got uncomfortable because he was at such a high arousal level all the time. So we had to get the stress level down in the beginning. So do a lot of relaxation work and different things because in the beginning he was not somebody who would concentrate on the same thing for long or even take the option of calming down with the chew toy or something to lick because he would get really frustrated that this was not going fast enough. And that's when we saw that licking works better than, than chewing because chewing, he would just swallow the thing whole if it wasn't something he could bite chunks off. <laughs> and that gets dangerous at some point. So we switched to licking and that worked really well. Although it had to be something that didn't last very long because again, he would get frustrated if it lasted too long. So nothing frozen and a bunch of other stuff that helps relax. And we got him to a point where he could really get his sleep and his rest in during the day. And he could really relax in a safe zone. So a spot where nobody would come toward him. Nobody would bother him and he could just wind down and relax. And that made things a lot better. 
it took so much out and we also stopped the whole socialization thing because the first trainer had told his mom that she needed to do a lot of socialization which is ridiculous because the socialization window closes at 12 to 16 weeks and he was three years old at that point so this was nothing that would help but she had to drag him to busy spots and busy areas and wherever he would meet a gazillion dogs and of course this made things worse because it increased the stress level he had no strategy to cope with the situation so he just fell back into his heel position thing and that made seeing his threshold almost impossible because he would stay in that heel position until he could not control himself any longer and then he would explode immediately and the worst he could so if he could reach the other dog he would bite that was why we also did a muscle training and he really had forgotten to give any signals before he would escalate he had unlearned that because he was punished with the first trainer every single time so whenever he looked away whenever he tried to walk in a curve whenever he licked his lips or tried to look away from the other dog he was punished every single time so he unlearned that and he could not contain himself forever so if the other dog was too close he would snap so what we did was we really watched his body language and really put our focus on tiny signals that gave away his stress level and they were really tiny it was sometimes it was only visible on video because we could slow that down but we just took it safely so we used a greater distance than he probably would have needed and we did a lot of calming things as well like scatter feeding some treats and stuff like that so he would put his head down and start sniffing so he could relax again he had regular vet appointments for physical health therapy to relax his neck again and we did some balance work and coordination and all those things to make him feel his body a little bit better and to relax his muscles so this was his new way of getting exercise they didn't walk for hours and hours and hours anymore they did really useful stuff like things he had to use his nose for with and coordination work and all those things that make his brain really tired and relax his body and that was when we did make huge success with his reactivity toward other dogs and in the house i told you in the beginning that he was suddenly snapping at visitors and this was something that he also did without warning so he would lay in a group of people who were chatting and having a good time and at some occasions not every time there were incidents like a person standing up a hand raised and he would snap he would also not warn in any way he would not appease in any way he would go straight for that person and this was where the relaxation zone helped a lot so whenever his mom had company over for longer she knew that at some point he would get a little more agitated or a little more easily startled so that was when she encouraged him to go into his safe zone and have some licking stuff and later on we introduced chewing as well and it worked fine when his arousal was lower so this was something that she gave him to do and whenever he was with the people she had over 
she muzzled him and she would encourage him to lie next to her because he had no issue with resources. He did not guard her. So this was something that helped her intervene whenever something unexpected would happen or something would trigger him. We did never know why he reacted that way, but it can be anything, right? Our dogs sometimes connect things that we would have never guessed. So now they are at a point where he does not need his muscle anymore, neither at home nor at walks, because he does no longer try to bite anybody. He can show his discomfort again, and it is very rarely needed because they have become such a nice team that she will know situations that are tricky for him even before they get tricky for him. So, for example, if they walk in the woods and they see another dog, she knows that this can get tricky for him. So she starts to do little things that help him get through the situation. Like, again, scatter feeding works really well for him. Searching for treats, so getting in a little bit of a work mode, that helps him too. And it takes his focus off the other dog and gives him something to do. And this is really how they get through those situations. He will never be a dog who could just play off leash because he doesn't like other dogs. They have a few dogs that can be off leash with him and he's fine with that, but he doesn't want anything to do with them. So he can walk next to them because they leave him alone and he would not do anything to them, stuff like that, but he doesn't interact. So he's just not a dog who is all lovey-dovey with other dogs, but that's fine. She accepts that, which is awesome. And that's why they have such a great relationship. She really had the guts to make this step away from that trainer, which is hard because let's be honest, we trust professionals in different areas of our lives. And to trust our gut when a professional says one thing and the gut says another, this is really hard. But in situations like that, it really pays off. So if you ever have the feeling that the methods or tools a trainer uses do not align with what you want for your dog or what you feel your dog needs, or even what makes the situation easier for your dog, because good training will always make the situation more comfortable for your dog. It will never suppress your dog and make him more uncomfortable. Never. Because this is not how learning really works. This is not how a relationship works. If we want our dogs to trust us, we have to help them. Because a dog will not trust us if we make situations even more uncomfortable with using tools or methods that do exactly that. So, yes, it takes courage. And it takes a very, very clever gut. And sometimes we have unlearned that we can trust our gut. But like Tink could relearn to show calming signals and to tell his human that he needs help, we can relearn to trust our gut. And this is what I want to encourage you today with this episode. And if you have any questions about it, if you want to go over a situation where you feel like there has to be another way, but you haven't found it yet, write me an email, write me a comment if you're watching on YouTube. And don't forget to like and subscribe if this video, if this podcast helped you in any way, because together we can help even more dog parents get the courage to help their dogs instead of just suppressing them. And you can help with that with a subscription 
with sharing the video if you're watching on YouTube. Share the episode if you're watching on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And I want to thank you so much for doing that. I think it's really heartwarming to see such change in our dogs and in our relationship as well. And that said, I wish you a lot of fun training and we'll see each other next time. Bye. Thank you.